Good evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP, Urbana 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I'm here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UCIMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or UPTV. So whose views are these? Well, that's actually a very good question. Um, these views are our own, and by our in this instance, I mean myself and my charming guest who will introduce herself right now. Um, hello, my name is Andrea Gothals. Um, I am a senior at the University of Illinois studying journalism, and um, I am currently working for my advanced reporting class on a beat, a continual topic that I'm doing a bunch of stories on about the immigrant communities in Champaign-Urbana. So that's kind of what brought me into the conversation today. Hmm. The immigrant communities, is that, how, how is that defined? Or how are you personally defining that? Um, you know what, I don't know. No one's asked me that question. <laughs> um, I can tell you a couple of the topics that I'm looking at. I wrote, I just wrote my first story for the class about the Hate Has No Home Here campaign. Oh, yeah. Um, that was just started in Urbana as a branch um, from the, the Chicago the Chicago campaign. It was started in North Park, uh, Chicago. Right. And so um, <clears throat> there's a guy who started a new branch here in Urbana. I started seeing the signs pop up. And so that was my first story, kind of looking at um, people's thoughts and opinions on them, what the goal behind the whole campaign was. Um, and then I also am looking at the CU Immigration Forum because mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I just, I didn't know it existed. Kind of looking at what you guys do and everything. Um, and then I'm also looking at the um, Urbana School System because I work as a volunteer um, in the ESL classrooms at the Urbana High School. Yeah. Um, I studied. I'm studying French as well. Uh -huh. So there's a uh, there's a big French speaking population here in Champaign Urbana, and so I work. Um, with the students who speak French, helping translate and interpret and just kind of help with schoolwork. So that's kind of what initially um, interested me in the, the diverse community. I guess I didn't know that we had so many people from all over the world right here. Mm. So um, doing so about that. And then I'm also working with the Refugee Center to kind of learn what they do and um, still in the works, I guess, for more specific uh, stories. Yeah. So you were doing the translating first? before you yes. decided this? Yeah, the first yeah. thing, I started volunteering last semester um, at the high school because um, I like speaking French. And mm -hmm. so one of my friends told me, hey, they need people who, they need help with um, French speaking students. They need people who can speak French. And I was like, oh my God, for sure. <laughs> I'm looking for opportunities, uh -huh. not even really knowing what I got, was getting myself into. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started working with the students and being in the classroom and I had I was impressed by the well, how many different languages were speaking in the ESL spoken oh my god yeah. in the ESL classrooms yeah um and yeah so I just I've been doing it ever since and I I, I honestly wish I had more time to get involved mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because it's cool it's just it's a different with a different language and culture I think you learn there's just different points of views and different I don't know it's just a different way of thinking than I it's a way of branching out, I guess. Open yeah. mind opening. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not. I, I was going to say I'm fond of telling this story about myself, but I, I'm not really because it's actually an embarrassing story about myself. But up and for many years, up until not that long ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I had always imagined that different languages were like just different words for the same thing. So, like, you know, this would be one two three four five in English and it would be uno dos tres you know what mm -hmm. I mean like yeah. for every word there was a counterpart that had the exact same meaning right it was just a different word and so as I started learning bits and pieces of other languages I, I kept getting people I kept getting I kept having people say things like well that's there's not really an exact translation for that and I was like what do you mean it, Right. How can there not, you know, there must be, there must be, because that's what a different, a language is. It's just a, a word system for doing this. And then, or they'd say, well, in, in this one, it would be like object, subject, you know, or the, you'd start with the subject and then go, or something is like backwards. And I'm like, that's just weird. I mean, why would mm -hmm. they do that? And it, 
took me forever. I mean, most of my life before I realized that different languages were actually whole different ways of thinking about and expressing thinking, you know, and that translations were just like roughly going, well, it's, they're saying something kind of like this. You know, this is what you would say in English, and this is, it's similar to this, but it's not the exact same thing. And then I realized that, and once I realized it, it was like, wow, languages are whole bodies <laughs> of information about a people and and the way that they you know have created their you know their culture and just the way they've kind of grown up and and evolved over time and then i realized that language is fascinating <laughs> but yeah me too <laughs> prior to that i thought it was just you know it just didn't you know it didn't affect me because no one had ever explained that to me for some reason they never told me i don't know why that you know that that's what a language was and then you start reading about languages that are disappearing you know that because oh, nobody yeah. speaks them it's like oh my gosh there's these there are whole ways of seeing the universe whole epistemologies that are going away because you know the takeover of, of English you know kind oh, of ruling for sure. the language world and another part of it I think is I think through this process I process I've learned I mean I've been sp studying French so I know it's hard to learn a language but being watching students who are thrown into a different culture with uh, in a different language mm -hmm. and like trying to learn it while you're also learning span or I mean math and um, oh, yeah. science is I is so challenging and it's yeah. like I'm like oh my god that it's just it's amazing that you have to learn those things I mean I try to translate for math and I'm like oh I don't sure. I don't know <laughs> I don't know what, how to explain biology you know what I mean right. and so yeah. um yeah, I think it's it's like inspiring. It's amazing to see people just you know getting out there and giving it a shot. <laughs> yeah, that's what amazes all my friends who are foreign students at the university. I think well, not only are they doing all the same work that everybody else in the class is doing, but they're also doing it in a language that's not even their own. You know, not the one that they were born with. So that's pretty cool I mean that's yeah. a lot of work it's, it's a lot of brain power going into yeah. that <laughs> and but there are downsides to that too which is um, I've spoken to a lot of friends who you know were English as a second language people came to the university and went through their whole educational experience and then when you ask them about it later they say well when I speak my original language it's usually it's just about stuff like you know social stuff mm, right but when I'm thinking technical or, or intellectual ideas it's in English and that's really frustrating to me because I, it's like I have two brains and one of them my higher thinking brain is English and my this sort of more everyday brain is my original language and they don't like that they don't like that that they've kind of forced their brain into thinking in that way you know yeah no I think that is really interesting and that's something that I've been looking at with the ESL programming uh, because I think it's interesting that there's one teacher and a plurality of languages in the classroom and so obviously mm -hmm. if the teacher can't speak all those different languages I mean there's different um, like <coughs> uh, Mayan dialects there's two Spanish speakers speakers French speakers Arabic um, and I think I'm sure there's other ones but um it's just amazing that the teacher is still able to teach to yeah. everyone, even though there's, in some cases, not a whole lot of commonality with language level or proficiency, mm -hmm. and that everyone is still able to learn. It's like, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. That's that's way out of my league in terms of like understanding how people make that work. Oh my god! I don't yeah. really know quite how they do it, but I'm fascinated by it. Mm hmm. And I wish I was better. I, I seem to have started, you know, one reason that I wish that I had understood the, the beauty or the, you know, the depth of language, the importance of it earlier is because I might have been able to learn better if I'd done it when I was young. Now that I'm decrepit and, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. I've gotten so I can understand. You can say things to me and I'll go, okay, I understand what you're saying more or less. I can't speak it. For what language do you wish you could speak or 
you any, can kind of understand. Any language. There, I can any. understand <laughs> a, a variety of languages. I mean, limited. Right. Like uh, in French, if you had, if you were speaking with someone in French, and I was listening, I would know at least what you were talking about. Generally, mm -hmm. like okay, right. they're talking about food, <laughs> or you know something like that. That'd be about it. But if I were suddenly dropped into France and and they'd like find your way around, I'd just be like, <laughs> it's a whole different parlez vous English. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I just I wouldn't. I can't take what I know and make it come out my mouth. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. And I don't know why that is. I don't know. It's like my capacity to absorb is pretty good and it's continuing to grow but my capacity to turn that into something that I can use is not it seems to be stubbornly stuck at go you know <laughs> oh yeah I can definitely understand that <laughs> it's, it's weird though it's frustrating learning languages is, is tough for sure I can imagine yeah. <laughs> when did you start um, I started studying French in high school and then I spent a semester abroad last year in France uh -huh. So um, I don't claim to be fluent or perfect by any means, but um, it's something that I want to continue studying. Mm -hmm. So, so I can say "parlez-vous français?" and you go. Bah oui, je parle français. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep hitting this thing, and it's really uh -huh. annoying. And so, what's your it's background? What have you? What did you do before this? How did you get to CU Immigration Forum? Well, I'm a second-generation immigrant. <clears throat> So, in a sense, I have always, how do I put it, in some way been connected to or involved with the topic as a as, as sort of a real life um, thing that I had to deal with in one way or another, you know, think about or, or be aware of or whatever. And um, CU Immigration Forum began as a uh, an idea of a few people who had been doing things related to immigrants, like helping immigrants or being involved in, in, in some sense or another. And with the, it was started with the thought that, well, what if we all had a place where we got together once a month and just shared our experiences and our ideas? So, you know, you're working over there with the French-speaking community, and I'm working over here with the, you know, the Spanish-speaking community. And we have both at some point had to find a lawyer, connect somebody with services, do stuff like that. So what if we got together and just sat down and you said, oh, well, I've had this weird problem. I, these guys are looking for a dentist. I can't find any dentist that will work with anybody. And I'd be like, oh, well, now I found somebody, and he's over on, you know, Third Street, and his name's so-and-so. And you go, great. And that way you wouldn't have to do reinvent the wheel basically I, I like to use that phrase because that's what it seemed like we were all doing in various ways was constantly from the ground up figuring out how to get things done for our friends and, or clients or whoever and that's how that's how the group began so I just I was uh, told about it by um, Ricardo you've, you've mm -hmm. met him right right he told me about it and said oh you should start coming to our meeting and so uh, did it start as kind of an informal kind of club or were they already established as the sea immigration forum um i don't i i think they used the name i started from like the second meeting i couldn't find the oh, first okay. one i went over there <laughs> at the appointed time and i walked around and i was like I, you know it's like room 1a or something at the y it's always been at the university y uh, but I had no idea, and I didn't ask anybody. I was just, like, walking up and down, like, yeah. peeking <laughs> indoors, and I just could not find where they were. So the first meeting I didn't go to, because I didn't know who I was looking for either. So mm. it's like, yeah. okay, I don't know these people. I don't know those people, you know. Um, yeah, so I did I answer your question? No, yeah, you did. Yeah, so I, I started, uh, like, practically from the first meeting, but I just didn't go to the first meeting. Yeah. And it just slowly evolved over time, because... Si simultaneous to that, that's very bad grammar. <laughs> At the same time, as we were beginning, there were a, a lot of people were questioning. Um, we'd heard of this program called Secure Communities, and um, people were saying, "Well, I have this friend. Their their um, her husband was picked up for something, and." It just disappeared you know he was like driving home from work and then she got a call like well, come pick up the car and you know he's 
he's in custody and then he was gone and they were like what happened to him you know what's going on here so uh, people the rumors about this program and what it meant and and what it did were starting to kind of creep up from uh, the the people being affected by them and so at the same time as we were starting to get together to just talk generally about this stuff we also like uh, practically immediately started this sort of subgroup which was uh, sort of an investigative unit if you want to call it that mm. so there was there was maybe half a dozen of us and we we were like okay we're going to find out what this is we're going to start talking to the sheriff we're going to talk to the uh, police chiefs we're going to do research online you know like what's the government say this is we're going to figure out what's actually happening so even as we started out as a group that was supposed to just sit and talk we also started doing actually doing stuff as a group using the name CU Immigration Forum like right away and and so we have continued that sort of dual track ever since. Okay and so how how did you become you're the president right? I am. And so how did you become president or what made you want to step up and take the lead role? Well again uh, a couple of things one at some point we decided that uh, early on uh, you know people would be like well I really like what you guys are doing I want to help support you um, I'd like to give you some money you know and we're like well we're not really set up for that <laughs> we're not really yeah. organized in that way and so we thought it would probably be a good idea for us to become a registered 501c3 that way if people did want to donate to us um, we would have a system and a process and we would you know whatever so um, the organizational aspect that that ended up demanding that there be a board of directors and a treasurer and all that stuff came out of that was just this desire to have uh, some kind of established organization that that made us um, follow a, a system you know a recognizable system for people so we did that as far as how I became president I'm really not sure um, I mean I was elected obviously but um, I don't know it's not like I ran for the job it was it was more like you know I'd have to ask somebody about this to be <laughs> sure I don't want to just make something up but it seemed to me it was it was like we were sitting around going okay we need we need officers like who would be good for what job and somehow someone thought that I would be good for that job I guess and here you are. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, you know, we, we each have sort of different skill set. And I think my skill set was um, that I was good at hearing what everybody was saying and sort of translating for each other. Because I don't know how many different kinds of groups you've been in, but there are lots of groups where people, you'll see them sitting there talking and you're just listening to them going, they're not, they're arguing, but they're not <laughs> talking about done. the same thing. This right. person is talking about this and this person is talking about it like that so they're kind of crossing each other and if only someone could say okay wait a minute what you mean you're talking about the performance of this thing and you're talking about the the uh, format and those are not the same thing you know and so if you could nudge each of them a little bit then they'd be on the same track and whatever and I find when I'm in groups I find that's what I end up doing a lot and I think that uh, in this group, that was a commodity maybe that was useful <laughs> to people. I don't know. <laughs> well, it obviously seems to be working. You're, you're still in the, in I'm the role. I'm still the president. <laughs> there may be a coup one of these days. I may, I may be ousted. <laughs> and that's been for how many years? How long? Well, it's, I think it, I don't remember. <laughs> I should really look into this because I, I wrote the, uh, the bylaws. I wrote all the constitution and that stuff and promptly forgot everything that I wrote. <laughs> so I have to look it up. But I think I, I have like some kind of term. I'm on my second term. I'm not sure. I suppose I could probably what, what keep the term going. Was. <laughs> Is this, this about four years, maybe five years, something okay. like that. I don't know. Well, so, but it sounds like you must put a <laughs> must put a lot of time then time and uh, time and effort into. Um, yeah. And all volunteer basis, right? It's all volunteers. Yeah, 
Uh, and I don't work as much as some people on it, but it seems like, well, it goes up and down. I mean, there, there were periods where it was just like, it was down to just maybe a handful of us at meetings and nothing really was going on. <laughs> we, we tend to be more reactive than active during those times because there's not enough of us uh, you know at at those lull periods there weren't enough of us to like make anything happen so it's more like well we're waiting until comprehensive immigration reform comes through or somebody you know we we just keep an eye on things and watch what's going on and then be prepared to respond to it in some way uh, then once this last election came and went uh, the interest exploded, you know, in terms of people it. who really wanted to be involved and wanted to do something because they were aware that there's this suddenly this whole new threat to immigrants. And because even though uh, Obama administration was deporting people left and right, they were slowly working towards a kind of uh, a system that that was hard to argue too much with. So it was like they were um, being pretty specific about if you have a criminal background, if you've done the following things, you know, you are eligible for deportation. If you haven't, then we're going to leave you alone. And in the beginning, like I said, for the secure community days, that's not what was happening. But people pushed back and said, wait a minute, do you know, this is picking up all sorts of people that you said you weren't interested in. So the government actually was like, oh, okay, you're right. That's oh, wow. true. And so they canceled secure communities after enough people f pushed back against it. Um, Trump has since revived it. But uh, <laughs> at the time, they had canceled us. So they invented this new program called PEP, which I forgot what it stands for, but it's priority something, priority enforcement protocol or something like that. Anyway. Um, it attempted to do the same thing in a slightly different way. I mean, the, the idea of secure communities and both and PEP both were, was to identify people who committed crimes, who were dangerous, were criminals, or if not dangerous criminals, at least serious criminals of some sort, and then put them at the front of the line for people to be deported and to take everybody else who's just like, you know, just living their life and doing stuff and move them to the back of the line. This served two purposes. One, it um, took a limited amount of money and made it go for something that was useful because they didn't have unlimited funds to mm -hmm. just deport people and round them up and find them and stuff. It just made, okay, we have X amount of money to spend. We want to spend it on getting people that really ought to be taken away, get them out first. And then if we have anything left over, we'll worry about this other stuff. That, uh, and plus for just safety reasons, it's just like, okay, if, if you're going to come here and, you know, be in our country, you should be obeying the laws and doing whatever. And there are some laws that you run afoul of simply by being undocumented, like you know, some kinds of driving things and oh, uh, right. uh, social, using social security numbers <laughs> and that kind of thing, you know, stuff that you become entangled with because of your lack of ability to get certain kind of documents from the government. And then other kind of crimes like, uh, you know, murder and robbery and things like that, which are like, hey, well, you know, if you're going to do that stuff here, you you're not even, don't even belong here anyway, so <laughs> yeah. you got to go. Um, so they were, you know, far from perfect, but they were working towards that, and you could tell, you could see it. And um, we, we actually met with ICE uh, oh, officials at one point. Yeah, oh, and we wow. talked to them. Was that hard like, to arrange? Yeah, yeah, super hard, but yeah, I mean, it. Because I've had people say, like, oh, for your story, you should get the other side of the scoop. Talk to an ICE official. And I've been like, oh, man, I'm sure that they're well, not going to take the time out of the day. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but I just would imagine that they're You could busy. probably do an interview. They sent some people down to meet with us. So. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, we could give you the that information. I'm sure Megan probably has it of who oh, we met with and all that stuff. But so how did it go? What did <coughs> Excuse me. Just getting over my cold. Um, it was okay. I mean, they said pretty much what you would expect them to say. Here's what we're doing. Here's who we're prioritizing, blah, blah, blah. You know, we don't allow agents. What we wanted to do was say, tell them, all right, we're hearing from people that your agents behave like this. We're reading on your website and stuff that your rules are this. These things don't go together. So we want to hear from you what is allowable, what isn't, and then we want to tell you that's not what we're hearing. Who do we contact? How do we, you know, complain about this? And they were very good about that. They sent a lawyer and a public relations person and somebody else. Oh, wow. And they went through the whole, like, here's what our agents are allowed to do. Here's what they're not allowed to do and all that stuff. And uh, here's who you contact if there's a problem and blah, blah, blah. And so it was a pretty good meeting in that respect. There has always been a disconnect between what these laws say and how people are enforcing them mm -hmm. that we've had a problem with. But at least throughout the Obama years, it was, um, how can I put it? It was at least something that you could complain about and, and hope to get some kind of response. Once the election happened, that all went out the window. And, and, and now every possible, uh, you've read some of these rulings, I'm sure it's yeah. just like anybody you can think of, anybody's relative that you've ever heard of or that even looks at you funny, you can deport them because you're now empowered to do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's pretty much they can do whatever they want. And there's no, no way to complain about that um, in terms of what we were complaining about before because they don't care. They're, they've already been told there's no rules, basically. You can, you know, you're free. <laughs> oh, wow. That's kind of scary to think about. <laughs> it's very scary to think about. And you, we've seen already, you know, in the news, if you've been following the news, you've seen all sorts of examples of, of dramatic overreach. They took a woman out of the hospital who had a brain tumor who yeah, was scheduled yeah. for emergency uh, operation. They took her out and took her to a detention center. Oh, my God. That's wow. just one example. I mean, and they're doing stuff like that. They're picking up, whereas in the Obama days, that like roughly 90% of the people that were picked up actually were, had, you know, felony conviction or something okay. like that. Now, uh, just in the last few sweeps, that's gone down to, I think, 75 or less percent in terms of who's actually like a criminal and who's just getting picked up because they happen to be there. And uh, I suspect that was before the recent uh, DHS memo that went out, which basically told them everybody's a priority. You know, right. we're lifting all restrictions, go for it. I'm sure that number is going to continue to creep downwards. Um, so have you guys seen direct impact in um, Champaign-Urbana, or do you have any kind of, like, um, I don't know, like, do you get an update? you have to, like, consult with the police, like, hey, can you give us an update when they're coming, or is there any way to get, like, the stats or something, or is that something you guys look into? Yeah, either? there is, and there are people that follow that stuff. Um, I don't keep that stuff on in my head. Um, most of the impact so far has been in perception. Oh. People are frightened. Um, every other day a rumor starts, oh, I saw an ice was over it here, and they were picking up this person, they were doing that, and um, that's weird. <laughs>